Thanks everyone who's joined this afternoon. We've still got a few more coming in. So we're just gonna give it another 30 seconds or so before we get started. Right. People are starting to forward a little less quickly than they were. So given that we just have an hour this afternoon, I'd like to go ahead and kick us off. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this 101 webinar focused on the U.S. budget and appropriations process for global health funding. We're so glad you could join us. My name is Ansley Moore, and I'm the Senior Manager for Advocacy and Engagement for GHC. We're the leading member organization devo devoted to advancing global health priorities by United Advocates, implementers, policymakers, and other stakeholders. Today, we'll take a deeper dive into the current U.S. global health funding landscape, a little bit more about what the process could look like, the timeline for the U.S. budget and appropriations process, as well as how GHC members and other advocates uh, can engage in this process. Mm -hmm. Juliet, would you advance the slide, please? Before we get started, um, I'd like to go also over a bit of a few of housekeeping items. If you would remain on mute during the presentation, we would greatly appreciate it. There will be time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. And during that time, please feel free to put your questions in the chat or feel free to use the raise the hand function to ask your question directly to our panelists. Um, as you can see, this session will also be recorded and we'll also plan to share the slides following the meeting. Um, and with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our two guest speakers for today, Fata Agwe and Katie Poster. Fata has served as the Congressional Lead for PATH for over three years. She oversees PATH's U.S. government policy agenda and is responsible for engaging with Capitol Hill. Uh, she also engages on the Global Health Coalitions and with U.S. government agencies around global health issues related to primary health care, maternal, newborn, and child health, immunization, and global health security. We're also very glad to have her as GHC's Budget and Appropriations Working Group co-chair, and she also co-chairs Interactions a DEI Working Group. Katie joined the Elizabeth Glazer excuse me, Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation's Public Policy and Advocacy Team 13 years ago. She oversees the U.S. portfolio and is responsible for engaging with Capitol Hill, the administration, and the broader global health community around global health issues, including policies related to pediatric HIV and AIDS. Katie also co-chairs GHC's Budget and Operations Working Group, as well as co-chairs the Global AIDS Policy Partnership. Thank you both for joining us today and really looking forward to this presentation. And with that, uh, Katie, over to you. Thanks so much. I'm talking on mute, I realize. Thanks, Ansley. And thanks to everybody for joining us today. I see lots of friends are here. So I'm glad that you're um, here to join us. And I hope um, you're not, don't be afraid to answer or ask lots of questions. This is an incredibly confusing process. And even after doing this um, for over 13 years at Egg Path, there's still things that confuse me and it changes me every year. So um, I just wanted to give a quick um, landscape overview in terms of how much money we're talking about here um, in global health. And thanks to Kaiser Family Foundation or KFF, and I saw Adam Wexler from, from KFF is on the call. I'm pretty sure he's the one who's behind these slides, um, create these charts for us. But you can see global health funding Stick to everything over time. Um, it's only gone up, um, not only, I should say, it's gone up about 30% over the last 10 years, but most of that has come in the last three or four in the post-COVID world and not post-current COVID world as the case may be. Um, and a lot of that increase has come because of increases to global health security and an increased contribution to the global fund. Most of the other accounts over the last 10 years have seen pretty incremental increases 
And a lot of our work as advocates has actually been protecting the existing money we have while still pushing for increases in funding. These light blue um, bars you see, those are when major global health emergencies happened. In 2015, we had the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And then obviously in 2020 and 2021, um, there was additional funding for COVID. But other than that, the, the funding has remained relatively flat over time, especially when you think about inflation and the purchasing power of this funding. You can go to the next slide. Um, but how is that pie broken up? So there's about $12.9 billion for global health um, funded by the U.S. That's both um, at, from USAID, CDC, and NIH. The bulk of this is at USAID, um, a little bit more than 10 billion of that. And as you'll see, um, HIV and Global Fund make up a very large proportion of that funding. Um, that's obviously PEPFAR as the HIV piece. Global Health Security, which has risen a lot in the last few years um, to become a bigger piece of the pie. And then MCH and malaria um, rounding out some of those bigger numbers. And as you can imagine, um, the way this pie is divvied up is pretty political. Um, when there have been big new initiatives, they get a lot of money. We haven't necessarily seen a ton of growth again in the last 10 years of these numbers, except for maybe Global Health Security and, and Global Fund. But um, it's not, you know, funding is not, and I say this as an HIV advocate, um, obviously HIV is a major, a major issue. But when you look at TB as the biggest infectious disease killer, only getting $406 million. It's not always about um, impact or need. It's about the political choices that the U.S. is making. So we'll go next. I think Fata is going to take over for me. I am. Thank you so much, uh, Katie. Um, so what I wanted to do before we go any further, because understanding that this is a complicated process, um, we want to make sure that um, the terminology that we're going to be spewing out um, is understood. And those of you who have joined our Budget and Appropriations Roundtable, you probably have already engaged in this space where you're like, they're just using acronyms and they're just throwing out these words and we have um, no idea what they mean. So um, I wanted to just go over them in a little bit more detail. So Katie already mentioned appropriations, which is what this webinar is all about. So appropriations is a law of Congress that provides an agency with budget authority. Um, appropriations also, an appropriation is um, allows an agency to incur obligations um, to and to make payments to the U.S. Treasury for a specified purpose. So sometimes what you will hear is that appropriations can be definite, which will say like this specific sum of an amount, or it can be indefinite, um, which is uh, um, there's an amount for um, maybe necessary for, for a certain account. Uh, in terms of appropriations, annual appropriations um, is, uh, or also called like one year appropriations or annual appropriations um, is for the physical year. So that's one year. Um, it's made and available for that specified year and expires um, after one year. So most of the time that we're talking about appropriations, we also say, we always say FY24, which is currently the conversation, um, as we're also preparing for FY25. So FY24 is just physical year 24, FY25, physical year 25. Um, Congress itself passes 12 um, annual, Congress is, let me rephrase, is supposed <laughs> Congress is supposed to pass 12 annual appropriations bills. Um, these appropriations bills, again, um, uh, can also, um, I'll talk about, uh, which is not on here, supplementals, uh, but appropriations, um, are, they're supposed to pass it each year. Again, this um, uh, appropriations acts um, provide budget authority to obligate and expend funds um, from the US tre Treasury. So. Again, the agencies that a lot of us track, USAID, CDC, NIH, um, et cetera, all, again, um, have appropriations bills that they're tied to. We specifically at the Global Health Council um, Budget Roundtable, we track Labor H or the Labor Health and Human Services and Education account, as well as the state and foreign operations and related programs um, account. 
also with appropriations, you hear multi-year appropriations. So some accounts um, have multi-year appropriations, which means it goes over a period of time that's longer than a year. So again, the definite definition is available for obligation um, during a defined, defined period in excess of one year. Currently, you might be hearing the term continuing resolution, continuing resolution, continuing resolution. What does that really mean? Continuing resolution is um, a temporary spending bill that allows the government to basically keep its operations uh, to continue um, until uh, or when a final appropriations has not been approved. Currently, we are on a CR um, uh, uh, that we are tracking for physical year 2024. 20, uh, and what that really allows is that the government is being funded as at the same um, level that it was from the previous year. So a lot of the accounts that we track are still being funded at the physical year 23 levels. Uh, and so you'll hear uh, um, that term. And then the final term that I want to, um, is not on there, but I just want to uh, bring to your attention is um, uh, authorization. So we talk a lot about appropriations, but there's another um, level to this ball game called authorizations. Uh, and so during each session of Congress, um, the committee uh, or a special committee um, can support a specific um, uh, uh, act or, or official business. Um, and the, what they can do is authorize specific funds or expenditures to be used for certain things. Um, and so um, some committees as you are navigating Congress, you'll hear, oh, that's an authorizing committee um, versus some, you'll say that's an appropriations committee. Um, so an example would be appropriations is that labor helps human services and authorization you would hear is help. Um, another, a subcommittee of that, that can authorize the authority of the labor um, um, health and human services account. Um, and then the final thing, I know lots of terms. Um, the final thing that I forgot to put on there Sorry, Ainsley. Um, so, sorry, Juliet. Um, is a report language. So some uh, uh, that came to mind because we're talking about appropriations bills. So report language refers to an information provided in reports uh, accompanying a committee's uh, 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 appropriations. So um, the House does require written committee report um, to accompany each bill. Um, the Senate does not, but the Senate Appropriations Committee does typically um, have a report um, um language. So report language contains more information and guidance for um, to departments um, around the, the, the appropriated text um, that is in. So it gives more detail around what has already been appropriated. Um, you can go to the next slide for me, please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I want to talk specifically um, before I turn it over to Katie around um, the labor, health, and human services account. As I first mentioned, uh, we, tr we track labor H, that's what we call it, the acronym, and we also track, um, and we also track uh, uh, SFOPs. Um, so for labor H, the two accounts um, that we, we track are NIH and uh, CDC. So um, labor H or um, LHHS is a bill, uh, appropriations bill that um, appropriates funds for the Department of Labor, Health and Human Services. Um, and so for us specifically, we focus on the Department of um, Health and Human Services portion of that. And so talking about NIH, we track three. Um, we track uh, Fogarty International Center. We track NIAID or NIAID, and then we track the Office of AIDS Research. Focusing on the first um, bunch, so for NIAID, I'm sorry, for Fogarty, excuse me, um, Fogarty, uh, again, is it's um, specifically the center um, strengthens international research and laboratory capacity, um, and it helps facilitate, facilitate excuse me, um, global research partnerships. It improves of surveillance, surveillance, and also emerging infectious diseases. Um, and so we track um, those levels from Fogarty. For NIAID, NIAID is the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, um, and it's been a global um, leader in infectious diseases um, threats, including HIV, um, malaria, tuberculosis, um, neglected tropical diseases, influenza, et cetera. And then for the Office of AIDS Research, it's just as it reads. Um, the OAR uh, has led um, the NIH in groundbreaking HIV research. 
Um, and so we track those accounts um, to ensure that uh, it, they're being funded at levels that really are yeah. sustainable for the research that are being done. Yeah. Um, and then for so CDC, um, for CDC, we track um, the Global Health Center. So the Global Health Center um, specifically provides it on immunization, provides, excuse me, expertise on immunization, on disease eradication, public health um, capacity building around the globe. Um, from the Global Health Center, we track the divisions. So the divisions that fall under that, that we track specifically are the parasitic diseases and malaria, global um, uh, public health protection, global HIV AIDS, global TV, global immunization. We also track um, under the CDC account, the National Center for Emerging Infectious, uh, Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases, which is NCEZID. Okay. We love to use a lot of acronyms. Um, so NCEZID work really just helps deepen scientific research um, and understanding for infectious diseases. It helps build public health capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to outbreaks, um, and then also flexibility for uh, within um, public health crisis. The, the other one, um, finally, is um, the Infectious Disease Rapid Res Response Reserve Fund, um, a tongue twister. <laughs> so the Rapid Re um, Reserve Fund, um, funds uh, is uh, um, one that we track because it establishes an emergency reserve um, that CDC can use whenever crises arise. Um, and so we continue to track this because when Ebola, uh, uh, Zika, uh, monkeypox, um, COVID-19, et cetera, um, have all emerged, um, this uh, 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 infectious disease fund has been depleted. So we continue to track that. And then finally, we track um, global WASH, um, WASH, um, we track across all of our accounts, both USAID and on the CDC side, we um, uh, 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 track water and sanitation. So that's where you get um, wash from. I will uh, stop there and turn it back to Katie to go over SFOPS. Thanks, Fata. And <clears throat> I think, as I said before, so under the Labor H um, bucket, it's about $2 billion, give or take. Um, and then under state and foreign operations, which is another one of the appropriations bills, and we'll talk about that process next, um, it's a little bit more than $10 billion um, for global health. And as you can see, it's complicated um, in how the money is divvied out. Um, there's a, a few main sub-accounts, the big ones being global health programs at State Department, which is essentially PEPFAR and the Global Fund, global health programs at USAID, and then um, the economic support fund, um, development assistance, um, contributions to international organizations, not to be um, confused with internet, the IO account, the international organizations account. But um, this is where you see the major disease um, level breakdowns. And in these bills, um, Congress will say, we want, here's the top line number, and this is how much we want you to spend on each disease or specific global health area. Um, what's unique about global health programs at state or PEPFAR is, and the PEPFAR account is that um, PEPFAR is, uh, State Department is not actually an implementing agency for global health programs. So PEPFAR gets the money at State Department. They have a, um, an office there. It used to be called called the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator. Now it's, um, it's a new structure, but then they then give money to um, both CDC and USAID get the bulk of the funding for PEPFAR to actually implement the program. And then there's also um, other implementing agencies like the Peace Corps, PERSA and DOD that are sort of outside of um, some of the traditional, what we think of global health implementing agencies. What else is really important to talk about here is um, under SOPS is where most of our multilateral contributions go, come in. So the Global Fund, the UN agencies, Gavi, um, the New Pandemic Fund, WHO. And um, oftentimes, and this is especially true with the Global Fund and Gavi, is that um, the funding is um, paired. So the, the bilateral and the multilateral funding is paired together and then is split out. 
So oftentimes when we're doing replenishments for the global fund, for Gavi, for um, or trying to get for the pandemic fund, additional funding, we have to be really clear and say we want additional funding, but not at the expense of the bilateral, because sometimes Congress will say, well, to up the global fund contribution, we're just going to take money out of PEPFAR to give it to global fund or to up the Gavi contribution, we're just going to take money out of the bilateral contribution. So it, it is um, we have to be really um, deliberate about our messaging there that we want to grow the whole pie often when we're talking about our contributions to our multilateral partners, which is incredibly important and in how the multilateral and the bilateral programs work together because um, they often come from the same line items, essentially. Um, and you can see here, like it's, we don't see these numbers for these disease specific um, sub accounts change very often, usually by really small increments, family planning being the um, outlier there because it does it can change drastically depending on the political party that is in control of the House or the Senate um, at the time. But for the most part, these stay relatively stable. We don't see one year a huge swing towards malaria and away from something else. Um, they generally, um, when a ball is in motion, it sort of stays in motion from a Congress standpoint, which is one of the reasons where why um, protecting these numbers is really important to us because um, it's it's um, once you go down, it's hard to go back up again. <laughs> but similarly, once we can get it up, it's they generally don't reduce it either. So um, we're really mindful in our advocacy to say when we want increases, which we will get into for all these accounts, which we obviously do, it's not at the expense of other global health accounts, other development assistance or humanitarian accounts. We really wanna grow the pie um, as a whole. So we can go to the next slide. So <clears throat> we're gonna talk about the full, um, the process here, but what's important is that when we talk about um, labor H or SFOPs or labor, labor Health and Human Services or state and foreign operations, those are the a subcommittee of the full appropriations committee. So that's divided into 12 and those are the two main committees that we care most about. We also talk about um, the committee chair, and that's the majority party is considered the committee chair and the ranking member, or sometimes we'll call them a ranker, is the minority party. Um, because the House and the Senate are um, two different parties right now, the majority on the House side is a Republican, but the majority on the Senate side is a Democrat. So, and that, and it changes, you know, obviously with each election. So we have seen Lindsey Graham, for example, go back and forth between, you know, um, majority to ranking um, or from chair to ranking back and forth and and same with other committees, you know, sort of multiple times. So we'll go to the next slide. So this is um, a process and, and I'm going to send a huge caveat here in that this is how things are supposed to go. And I'll also talk about how things are actually going this year, tw fiscal year 2024 being somewhat of an outlier, but not necessarily that far out of the box of where we are. But, um, and I'll, I'll mention in here, here as well, this is the congressional process, but also where us as advocates are weighing in on the process. So we're going to talk, we're going to talk about fiscal year 2024. And as um, Fata said, fiscal year 2024 began, this is where it gets confusing because it's not calendar year, October 1st of 2023. So the fiscal year 2024 process began in August of 2023. And in August of 2023 is when us as advocates go to the Office of Management and Budget, which is an office of the White House who creates the president's budget. And we give them our request for um, fiscal year 2024, um, what we're asking them to put in the president's budget. Um, what's important to note here is that from a global health community standpoint, we have um, many working groups, on, again, on different disease areas, on HIV, on malaria, on um, neglected tropical diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And those groups of, of experts and advocates um, for those diseases, they get together and they say, what is the need? What do we think the U.S. Um, contribution on the bilateral, and the multilateral side should be? And we base that. and, and 
not discounting the political environment that we're in, but generally by need, what do we think the president should suggest to Congress for funding for the next fiscal year? We meet with OMB um, members. They're, they have wonderful staff who are experts in this area. And we talk about our requests and they start to be begin to develop um, the president's budget. So again, we met with, um, with them in Actually, I take this back. We met with them in August of 2023 for the FY25 budget. So we met with them in August of 2022 because the president's budget comes out nine months later. So this is a very, I guess to say, a very long process. So that happens in of the prior year. And so in 2022, we met in with OMB. In 2023, in which which I think actually was on time in February of 2023, the president releases um, their, his budget, hopefully her budget one day, um, asking for what he thinks um, the different levels for all of these government accounts should be across the 12, 12 appropriations bills. It's a very, very thick document. Essentially, it's a messaging document. It's not real money because um, unless unless his party is is controlling both the House and the Senate, um, it's not going to come to fruition. They might take some ideas, but generally they're like, oh, this is nice. And then they sort of put it on a shelf. Um, we're, again, we're more likely if, if for right now, because we have a Democrat president, we're more likely to see the Senate implement policies that President Biden lays out in his budget in their appropriations process than we are in the House because they're controlled by Republicans and they generally just sort of put it on the shelf. Um, so then we come to March, um, and in theory, this very rarely actually happens, but in theory, Congress is supposed to pass a House and a Senate budget resolution. We actually most likely often see this happen during, um, when the House and Senate and the White House are all controlled by the same party, but, um, because you can pass things as part of a budget resolution with a simple majority. You don't need 60 votes in the Senate. Um, and so like most recent tax legislation we see through this budget process, um, it doesn't happen very often though. But what we do advocate for during this time, whether or not there is a budget resolution and a combined budget resolution is that we work as part of the broader um, community, again, for de with development assistance, humanitarian work, et cetera, to advocate for a really strong top line number. Again, we want to grow the entire pie. Um, we don't just want to cannibalize the account for global health. Um, so it's really important for us to work with our colleagues. There's a lot of global health council members that also do de um, development and humanitarian work as well. Um, so we work with those bigger communities to try to grow the pie. Um, whether or not a budget resolution passes. Um, the appropriations committees, as we said, will start to develop their legislation. And this is really where the rubber hits the road in terms of advocacy. And we're hitting, in theory, hitting that period right now. And this is where advocates, both Global Health Council as a whole and our working groups, um, reach out to congressional offices and we ask them to support um, robust funding, a specific number, for the different global health subaccounts, um, one of our our best advocacy tools during this time are what are called dear colleague letters, and members of Congress will write a letter to the committee um, chair and ranking member, and they'll say, "Hey, we think maternal child health is really important. We want you to either robustly fund it, or they'll put a specific number there." And then look, all of these colleagues of ours agree with it and a bunch of other members of Congress will sign on. Well, us as advocates, our job is to get other members of Congress to sign on to those letters. So it's a lot of calls and a lot of emails, but you'll see, especially some of the big ones, uh, maternal child health, nutrition, um, HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, you'll get over 100, 150 members of Congress signing on to these letters to show this robust support. Um, in this springtime, in the spring, into summer, um, sometimes into fall, sometimes into winter, um, the subcommittees will release and what we call mark up their legislation. So the House and the Senate, we'll talk about SFOPs or Labor H here specifically, will release their pieces of legislation with the accompanying report language that 
um, Fata mentioned, and they'll have a committee meeting um, to mark up, quote unquote, mark up, meaning like, oh, we're going to make changes. They don't, they very rarely make changes to the bills. This is one they'll also hear. Um, oftentimes, um, we hear that members are putting up amendment. Um, so members will try to amend the draft bills to get their priorities, numbers to go up, numbers to go down, um, policy writer language added to these bills during this process time. Again, in theory, these bills would pass out of subcommittee and then the full committee would pass them. And then the and then they would go for vote on the floor of the House or the Senate and the entire um, chamber would pass them again, in theory. In theory, then what would happen is called a conference where the two sides would get together and say, how do we reconcile these bills? This is a, another really important time for advocacy because at that moment in time, we have to oftentimes the House number and the Senate number are wildly apart. So the Senate might be higher, the House might be lower or vice versa. And we have to try to get them to use the highest number of those two bills. And um, it's a time for us to put a lot of pressure on members to write letters, to do additional advocacy and meetings, because this is really your last chance to say, hey, this, this funding is really important. Then they would pass the bills and it would be final. What actually has ended up happening, and, I, and I'll use um, fiscal year 24 as an example. So I said we started this process in August of 2022. The president released his budget last winter. They finally released the bills, I think, over the summer and into the fall. And as Fata said, they passed a continuing resolution. Not uncommon. I've been at EGPATH for almost 14 years. There's always been a continuing resolution. Normally, that continuing resolution goes somewhere into November or December. They say, okay, we need a couple extra months to like work this out, see what's going to happen, whatever. Um, the issue with this year is that we are now in almost March and we still don't have a final um, fiscal 2024 um, appropriations. It's not uncommon. This has happened before in the last 10 years, but it's not usual. Usually they have this short up by December. Maybe the latest is in January. Um, we expect based on um, our conversations with the Hill over the last week, they, they're, they've extended it again. We pass another continuing resolution. Um, we expect that they will actually finalize these bills and um, state and foreign operations and Labor, Health, and Human Services should be finalized by the end of March, but we're six months into the fiscal year. At this point, the, the main issue with these um, really late CRs is that if we see any major cuts to these global health lines, we're really going to feel it in the second half of the year because this first half of the year, the agencies have been spending um, as if they were getting flat funding. Similarly, if we see major increases, it gives it a shorter period of time for them to get that money out the door. And it creates a lot of uncertainty. I know there's other implementers um, like PATH and EGPATH on this call. Um, the agencies get skittish about handing out money if they don't know how much they're going to have. And so um, as, as advocates, we always try to push them to actually finalize funding because it's really important for the stability um, of, of the program and of funding. So I think next is Ansley. Thanks so much, Katie and Fata. That was so incredibly comprehensive. I know I've seen a few comments in the chat of how they no one has ever heard it explained quite that well. So thank you so much for that. I'm looking forward to the questions in just a few minutes. But before we get to Q&A, I just wanted to run through a bit of sort of how this all ties together, at least for the role of GHC and our members. And so echoing a little bit of what both Katie and Fata have already said, um, this is a bit more information about how GHC supports its members and engages in the U.S. appropriations process. So we help to align the community around the required global health investments that the U.S. should make. Uh, this uh, includes putting together a letter for the Office of Management and Budget that Katie referenced earlier, sort of a consolidated 
um, document that the administration can reference that has the global health community's funding recommendations, as well as justifications for those recommendations. Um, and this is something that we could be used uh, sort of throughout the rest of the process um, when we're talking to Hill staffers and, and things of that nature. We continue to use this document throughout the year with different policymakers. Um, as Katie and Fata also mentioned, the GHC uh, Budget and Appropriations Working Group leads a lot of sign-on letters that help to articulate the community's recommendations. Um, Katie mentioned Dear Colleague letters that we sort of stomped for um, on the Hill. That's in addition to the community sign-on letters that we support um, that we would send maybe in response to the President's budget request or a House or Senate proposed bill or encouraging uh, House and Senate leaders during the conference process to uh, give the strongest possible global health funding, um, you know, at the whenever that final bill is is done. Um, we also help to organize meetings with Hill staffers for members. Uh, we call them colloquially Hill Days. Um, we do this in person. We also do it virtually, recognizing that um, some of our members are in the Washington D.C. area and some aren't. Um, but these meetings really help emphasize um, with staffers who may be new to certain offices or just new to the sort of international affairs or global health portfolios in general and help to uh, build relationships and hopefully build champions on the Hill. Um, as far as GHC, we also want to keep our members up to date with what's going on uh, with the U.S. budget and appropriations process. And as you can tell, from just the few minutes that we've been on this call, it's quite confusing and things can change quite quickly. Um, and so we do that through our monthly budget and appropriations working group meetings and also um, communications um, through email and our newsletter as well. So with that, I think we are ready for, um, sorry, this is, sorry, one last slide on our working groups. You can see the budget and appropriations working group, um, but you can also see many of GHC's other working groups that focus on certain thematic areas. Um, and this is a way for members to, as I mentioned, engage with GHC and our members and participate in the collective advocacy that we do. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Q&A. And as a reminder, you can drop your questions in the chat if you're more comfortable with that, or you can use the raise hand feature and we will happily take your questions. So. Ansley, I can answer Russell's question in the chat about sure. authorization Thank process. You. This is a, this is a really good question because I know a lot of us, especially me, I spend most of my time right now on PEPFAR reauthorization and, and what does that mean? Um, each authorization is different for different amounts of times. PEPFAR is for five years, but I know that um, other authorizations are for different amount of times. I think what's really important to note is that other than PEPFAR, um, most of the other global health accounts don't have regular authorization bills. They're essentially authorized through the appropriations process. By Congress giving them money, it gives them permission to exist. There's usually, I think, one line in the bills. Um, but the author, I like to think about it like this. Authorization is permission for, for an activity like hey, mom, can I go to the movies? Yeah, you can go to the movies. She authorized it. But did she give you $20 to buy a ticket? That's the appropriation. <laughs> so that's sort of how I think about it um, in, in those processes. Um, and most of the most of these global health programs are operating as if your mom just gave you 20 bucks and didn't tell you, yet, you know, and just sent you to the mall. You know, they tell you you can go, but without you explicitly asking. So um, the processes work sort of in a different timeline and separately, they're totally different committees. So um, House Foreign Affairs Committee and Senate Foreign Relations oversees the PEPFAR reauthorization process while it's funded through SFOPS. Um, and it just depends on what is up in any given year and sort of what those, those, when those expirations are. But for the most part, these programs will continue to exist absence of an authorization because appropriators will give permission when they're handing out the money. Um, and I'll just add to Katie's point that uh, Congress uh, is not required through appropriations to um, provide funding for an authorized um, program. So it's like, it's this crazy thing where like, 
they're two separate, but they're supposed to work together, but they don't have to. And so there's a lot of conversation that has to ha be had between appropriators and authorizers, especially if um, uh, so, uh, uh, a committee or some uh, specific uh, uh, representative wants a program um, to come to fruition. One of the th uh, ones that is currently like a topic of conversations, for example, global health security, in December of 2022, the National Defense Authorization Act included $1 billion for global health security. But here we are in F um, fiscal year 2024, and they're looking to cut that program um, significantly in terms of the amount of funding. So it's like, well, it was already authorized. Well, you told me that's what you want, but doesn't mean I have to give it to you. And that's why we always say, like, appropriators hold the purse. So they're the ones who are like clutching the money and they can decide what they want. So authorizers also to a certain extent wanna be friends with uh, appropriators to make sure that what they want done, they can get done um, with the bills and things that they're working on in their committees. Um, so just wanted to add that as well. Yeah, that's important. I think people think that an author authorization, there's bazillions of authorized unfunded um, activities out there. Just looking for raised hands or any questions in the chat. We have oh, eight. this is a really good question, Katie Wells. I see, and you know, what? I have a note here, and I didn't, I didn't say this when I was talking. If you go, Julia, if you can go back to the SBOPS um, graph, this is a very important note. So here is the entire SBOPS portfolio, but especially. Um, especially everything that's under global health programs and state and global health funding programs at USAID, 10% of that money is supposed to go towards health systems. Um, it's a little, it's self-reported and it's <laughs> the definition is a little sort of amorphous, but in theory, 10% of all of this funding um, of this, you know, so about a billion dollars should be going towards um, health system strengthening, health systems development. Um, additionally, the administration proposed in their last budget, so in their um, fiscal year 2024 budget that came out a year ago, um, for a help, a specific health worker program. Um, the Senate put some money in for it. The House didn't. It remains to be seen if it ends up in the final bill. I think it's probably unlikely given where we are um, in the negotiations. But um, I think there is a lot more thought going forward around um, how do you fund health systems with, within these vertical programs? Politically and realistically, these vertical programs, they're not going to mash all these programs together and say, hey, let's just have one large global health account. It just doesn't work like that because politically you can count. You can say for PEPFAR, we have this, we've saved this many lives. For malaria, we can say we've handed out this many bed mats, you know, value for money. Um, but I think looking across those cross-cutting issues is something that Congress is thinking more about, especially given the um Ebola and the and um, COVID outbreaks, whereas, I mean, literally 10 years ago, you couldn't even talk about health system strengthening. That was seen as like, you know, sort of a thing not to talk about on the Hill. So, um, but yes, 10% of this should go to health systems. Um, and I can add that there is a health system strengthening working group um, as part of the Global Health Council that is yep. actively working on um this issue um, that you mentioned in part of the second part of your question. Um, and so like working with offices, for example, I know Senator Cassidy, <clears throat> I'm so, sorry, Senator Cardin and others um, have been engaging with our community around um, not just earmarks, but ensuring that there's such a specific legislation around health system strengthening to really encompass the issue of ensuring that all programs are, you know, there's certain percentage of their funding is is going to health systems. I know that um, there was a report that came out that there's a disproportionate amount of like maternal child health funding that goes towards health system. It contributes like largely to the pot versus like others. So they're trying to see how do we even it out across um, accounts. So that's definitely something um, that um, if you want to engage with that working group, I know that they've been doing amazing work and even doing a report language around health systems for this um, appropriation cycle um, that we can definitely share with you if interested. Um, and then 
I think I see another question around, oh, David's question, great question. Um, how much influence does the minority have over an appropriations bill and the ac accompanying report? David, David. Um, <laughs> great question. Uh, it depends, right? It really depends on, you know, uh, I like to say in, when I'm uh, um, uh, on the Hill, you can tell who has the majority. <laughs> Um, and it's telling in terms of what really is going to be included as a priority in appropriations legislation. But then how slim is that majority is also um, um, up for, you know, debate. And so you see a lot of the conversations that are being had is that there has to be some negotiation between Dems and Republicans because some within the party do not agree necessarily on the direction of where the appropriations funding is going. So you have to pull in, you know, go across the aisle and pull in others to, you know, um, support. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it depends on what the the ruling party's priorities really are. Um, and you can tell um, when you start to see even that initial um, release of their bills, you see which accounts got plus ups and you start to see, okay, this is the direction that they want to go, go in. Um, and that's very telling. Um, and, but I think that it's also important that there is bipartisan, when it comes to report language, I've seen a lot of bipartisan uh, 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 conversations that were had um, with in negotiation, but also with the language that came out. Um, even if they're, um, uh, uh, if the, the Republican or Democratic Party is ruling, some of the report language have been consistent. I've seen across first our health accounts. A lot of them have been, and we've gotten some great um, uh, uh, messaging in there, regardless of the party um, um, that has been ruling. So it also, I would add to end, um, and Katie, please um, jump in. I think also as advocates, one of the things that we're trying to prioritize in our role as co-chairs is our relationship with um, appropriations, right? Our relationship with authorizers and appropriators. We have our meetings that we have um, with them. And it's so important because we continue to beat the drum and continue to show that our accounts are a priority in and out of appropriation season. I think all year is appropriation season for us, but it's so important to maintain that because they're getting, you know, hammered with everybody else. We Foreign um, aid is only 1% of the total budget. That's a slim 1%. And we're all kind of fighting to get development, humanitarian, and global health assistance all in there. And so we have to continue to beat the drum, the importance of global health um, to see that. Um, please go ahead, Katie, if you have anything no, to add. I, I think that's exactly right. And I think a lot of it is personality driven too. And I think right now we're seeing that staff can get along, they talk to each other, and I think they're really respectful of each other. So even if they have different priorities, you still see like the ranking members' priorities end up in the bill, even if they're in the minority party, at least in a in some way. Um so I it yeah, it's it's and and the winds change quickly, so you can't develop a relationship only with one side in one chamber because, um, you know, two years from now, um, things could be really different. Alex, I see your hand up. <laughs> Thanks a lot for this. Um, thanks. This is super helpful. Um, this is Alex Wade from Doctors Without Borders. I was curious, um, if you're trying to track down what's the most um, current information around the potential of funding that might be in the pipe for a specific issue. So a bill that's not yet passed, but being considered. if you want to sort of try to look at what are they currently considering for funding PEPFAR for pandemic fund, how much money might nutrition get next year? What resources can you use to, to find the most accurate information on where we're at currently, even if it's bills that haven't passed yet? Uh, what, research, what what do you use to to try to determine what's what's currently being what what numbers are we currently at that that are being considered? Yeah, this is a good question. So there's yeah. a, a couple a couple things. Number one, historic funding, and then also some funding charts. Kaiser KFF. I know um, Adam from KFF is on the call. They have good um, funding sources. When we're in the process, so when the House has released their bill or the Senate has released their bill. The best resource is if you go to congress.gov, I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's true, congress.gov, yeah. and they actually have an <laughs> appropriations um, tracker, um, a and it charts the bills, and you have to know how to read them. This That could be a whole nother hour-long seminar on how to read the appropriations bills, but um, 
they they will have the legislative language and the report language and it varies by chamber you know sort of which has the has the better breakdown but it'll have the numbers um by um, account and sub account in those bills and that's where we all pull our data from um from those bills in the interim time so like where we are now where we have a house bill and a senate bill where in some cases the numbers are wildly different it's all like based on our relationships and people are not giving, you know, they're, they're not giving us that much information. They'll sort of like, be like, well, we're going to wait and see. It's a really tough year. And they'll tell us that they've been telling us that since whatever, since October. Um, but we won't know until we see the final numbers and they tend to keep that information really close to their chest because they don't, um, they don't want to get like an, you know, an onslaught if they're going to cut PEPFAR, they're not going to cut PEPFAR, but they, they were going to cut PEPFAR by a billion dollars. You know, they don't, they would be, they get an onslaught of, of advocates coming at them. But, you know, for this year where we are, assuming they get to final bills at the end of March or by March 22nd, when the next deadline mm -hmm. is, we think it's going to be a really tough year for global health. I think we're going to see cuts for sure. What they look like and how they're spread across the accounts, we're not sure. Um, we, we expect there to be a reduction to the global fund contribution because there are issues with the global fund match. So for the global fund, um, for every dollar the U.S. puts in, the um, global fund has to find two additional dollars. They wouldn't be able to keep up with our contribution, you know, contribution over time. So that reduction is, is fine for all intents and purposes. We'd like to keep that money in global health, but that's a, a story, you know, a, a long <laughs> running conversation. But we expect there will be cuts to other accounts. So, um, but what those look like, we won't know until we see um, the final bill. Um, and to add to that and actually um, answer the next question, I think by Bistra around, please speak on to the current trends and opportunities for new funding priorities apart from the streams you show today. I think what Katie said towards the end of her, her, her um, statement is correct in terms of, it's very hard to really see new funding streams currently with where we are. So we talked about appropriations, right? And we talked about the bills and Katie alluded to, you can even see like, oh, historically over time, the increases, which haven't been a lot outside of like COVID years in terms of like during the, the, the really the heat of the pandemic, but there was a debt deal that was signed um, that is going to last not only for physical year 24, but also physical year 25. So we, as you know, your advocates and your co-chairs, we went to a meeting with the Office of Management and Budget and we came with our priorities and we're like, this is the year, you need to increase all global health funding, we need new funding lines, et cetera, et cetera. And they told us, hold your horses, don't forget, there was a bigger deal looming above your accounts, which is the debt deal. And that debt deal says that there has to be cuts. And how much, we don't know. And that's where we're waiting to see the trends for what is going to be released, I think, next week, we were told, for, for the accounts. But there will be cuts. And so we know that trending over time for the next two years, there will be cuts to accounts and issues that we care about, or at least there will be flat funding for, for them. We also saw this within the release of the bills, um, the top lines back in the summer that Katie alluded to. So for us that track the Center uh, um, for Disease Control, that track um, NIH, NIAD, those accounts I, I was talking about earlier in my slides, there was a appalling num like numbers that were released that were just like, we do not see these as a priority. And it was shocking um uh, uh, uh to our community same thing for those who track global health security for an example global health security has been a trend right we've all been seeing funding going and pouring into usaid global health accounts but when the house released their bill there was no number for global health security which says they are looking into that pot and seeing there's something that they want to get out of it that they they don't feel like they're they're, they're getting um and so we're continuing to track the trends over time, but we know that consistently all the accounts that I think all the sub accounts um, Katie alluded to, there hasn't really been significant increases outside of global health security. And that's what we are continuing to push as a global health council, that if you're going to the meetings, push for your account, but also let them know that top line is not growing. That pot is not growing and we need that pot to grow significantly to be able to fund at the levels that we see the need. 
getting started. Yeah, it's very hard to get new money. Really, 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 really. It takes years. It takes, but um, that's why the relationship building is so important that, you know, sometimes it just, you have to set the stage for years and years until they finally, you beat them down. <laughs> they finally get in. Um, I see the question about TB, um, lesser priority. This is a really great question. And I know, I mean, egg calf are TB advocates and and others. It just, it's just, I don't know. It's not sexy enough. I, for like, it's, it's one of those things where, where the politicians have just have not given it the attention it deserves. And I think, um, you know, we saw, we've seen like really big leaps in HIV and malaria, you know, which happened about 20 years ago because of, um, how dire the situation is. I think TB is such is is bad, but it's much more been a trickle than it has been sort of as a really serious problem. And we see this with COVID, it like huge surge of money and then it like went away, even though COVID is still impacting our global health pro programs across the board. So um the TB advocates who are amazing, and I um I can say that because I'm not egg, I don't lead TB for egg path because that does on my team, <laughs> um, have secured increases for TB, um, some more significant increases in the last few years and continue to push for it. But yeah, it's just, you know, why some things get money and others don't is, is sometimes like a, a kind of like a shrug. Um, it just depends on who's in charge and what they decide they want to prioritize at the time. I think we may have time for one or two more questions. But in the meantime, while people are thinking of, of a few more questions, I'll just say that, um, while the budget and appropriations working group is a really great way to engage on the sort of overall um, global health top line, as well as keeping track of sort of the trends in all the different accounts. Um, our other working groups like Fato reference the global health security working group. It's also a great way to take a deep dive if those are the accounts or the you know thematic areas that you're really interested in. Um, I know my colleague Alice is on the line and is always happy to talk to um, anyone who's interested in, in getting engaged more in GHC. Yeah, and I'll just say, I mean, uh, um, and I, I don't just say this as, as a co-chair of two of the big roundtables <laughs> budget and appropriations lobbying, but our voices together are stronger and being a part of Global Health Council and um, a part of the, um, a part of the coalition, it just, it's, Congressional staff don't want to hear from 10,000 of us 10,000 different times. Like they want a unified voice. They they are more likely to work with us when we are streamlined and we are clear. And um, I think it's just really important for our advocacy that that we're talk, we're speaking with one voice. And I think the global health community does a really good job of that. And honestly, why we've been successful yeah. in maintaining our funding this over this time, because we do have a strong community that sticks together. Agreed a thousand percent. Um, I think that um, ways to engage, um, uh, Katie and Ainsley talked about it. We do have Hill Days. Um, we do different um, working groups do, but also as a round table for the global health budget, we will be planning our Hill Days as well. Those are great ways to beat the drum, especially for growing that top line pot. Um, we'd love for, if your organizations are a part of Global Health Council, to join us um, as advocates um, during those meetings as well. Um, and in other ways, is just maintaining that those relationships congressionally um, with folks that we know will champion our issue. We, champions are very important because they can speak on our issues on the floor. They can speak on our issues with their colleagues. Um, and they can speak on our issues um, with their constituents, which is so important, especially to maintain the priority of funding global health, but the foreign aid account as a whole um, is an important um, account as well. So I think if you have any more questions, I'll turn it over to Ainsley. I see that we're at time. Thank you so much, Fata. And Juliet, if you wouldn't mind going to just the next slide, we'll give people the opportunity. If you have more questions, want to learn more, please reach out to advocacy at globalhealth.org. Um, as we mentioned at the top of the hour, we'll be circulating the recording from this event as well as the slides and really appreciate everyone's engagement and amazing questions. Um, thank you so much, Katie and Fata, who did an incredible job explaining a really crazy process. We really appreciate it and thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thanks everyone.